is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 203, covering the week of January 27th through January 31st, 2020. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can go to abbevilleinstitute.org, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook, and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday. While you're there, click on that support tab. You can support the Institute with a tax deductible donation. We do exist on your generous contributions alone. You can also click on that shop tab. And you can get your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's great, high-quality embroidered stuff. So if you want to support the Institute and advertise the Institute, go on out and get your Abbeville Institute apparel. Also, download our free mobile app. Just go to your application store on wherever you get that. Click on or look for Abbeville Institute. Click on that download button and you get the Abbeville Institute on the go. It is free of charge. So it's a great way to keep up the Institute. You've got our lectures, our podcast, uh, mobile access to the website, a lot of great stuff. So there's a lot of ways to support the Institute. And again, share it around on social media, like our, uh, like our stuff, share it with your friends, rate our podcast. These are ways that people will find this material and find our, our uh, great high-quality articles and, and our podcasts and lectures. And that's how we're going to help explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition together. This is something we do together. It's not just something that I do or the writers at the Institute do. It's something that you do as well if you're listening to this podcast or reading our articles and sharing them around. It's something we all do. This is a collaborative effort in trying to get people to see there's something to this South. All right. All that said, let's talk about the material for the week. Um, I think one thing that's always remarkable to people uh, is that 50 years ago, if you were a leftist in the South, you still liked Robert E. Lee. That you didn't have to be a conservative you, you were just a Southerner. You admired Lee. And you see it with someone like Shelby Foote in the Ken Burns Civil War series on PBS, which in many ways is awful. But people actually pan that series because Shelby Foote is in it and he's pro-Southern. That's one of the reasons people pan the series. I say it's too pro-Southern. We need a we need a war series that's not pro-Southern. There's nothing pro-Southern in it. It's just the South needed to be punished. And so it's amazing to me how far we've come in even 30 years. I mean, the the PBS series came out in the 1990s. That's not even 30 years ago. And here we are, less than 30 years later, and if you say anything nice about Robert E. Lee, you are committing heresy now because of things like social media, uh, the mainstream press, all of those things, mainstream historical establishment. I mean, look, try to write a positive biography of Robert E. Lee today and see if it gets you a job in the academy. It won't. In fact, you'll get blacklisted. I mean, this, this idea that somehow the academy is not political, and they just want to exchange ideas, and they want to think about things, and they want that's complete bunk. Write something that's laudatory of Lee, or anything really conservative, and you will not get a job. Nine times out of ten, you're not even going to be considered, uh, unless you go work at a a Christian college or a conservative school, and there are very few of those. You could get a job there, but even there, when you look at what conservatives now say about Robert E. Lee, uh, it's very difficult to think that this is somehow going to be a path to success in modern America. And I think this is tragic because if we really want to talk about ideas and we really want to talk about great Americans, and of course last week we talked about Lee quite a bit and Jackson, but if you really want to talk about great Americans and what made someone great, the character traits that we should be admiring in men, I mean there's no better example than Robert E. Lee, except perhaps George Washington. Lee's character, and I know that I had someone comment to me the other day on my own YouTube channel where I did a, and of course I published it here too, where I did a 
book review of Pryor's book, Reading the Man, or I called it Misreading the Man. And he said, well, this book, I mean, it doesn't get into the hero worship of Lee that Freeman does in his four-volume biography of Lee. This is true. In fact, it's a hit piece. And while I said there are certain parts of that book that are actually decent, the objective is clear. Pryor wants to make Robert E. Lee into nothing more than a middle class, average middle-class American who's elevated to a status he doesn't deserve. That's the objective of the book. And now I find out that Alan Gelzo is also writing a biography of Robert E. Lee. Well, I'm sure it's going to be high-quality material, let me tell you. Because Gelzo has been on record, and of course he's presenting at Stratford. This is the, this is the thing that gets me today. Places of honor for these people of the South are now inviting, are inviting these vitriolic anti-Southern scholars to do presentations. Why? I mean, I can understand doing things for reasons of, well, we want to have balance. We want to have, uh, we want to have both sides of the story. But they don't get both sides. This is what they're getting. And Gelzo was the conservative who's going to go and rip Lee. He's been on record saying Lee was a traitor. You're going to go to the place where Lee called home and call him a traitor. Think about that. Does anyone go to George? Do we invite British scholars over to America and have them present at Mount Vernon and say George Washington was a traitor? Do we do that? No, we don't. But you could. I mean, look, the British said he was. One of the things that riles people up about the 1619 Project is that the lead piece, which there's so many problems with it, but the lead piece says that the war was fought about, the American War for Independence was fought about slavery. And people are very upset about that. Oh, no, no, no. You can't say that about the Founding Fathers. Well, I mean, objectively, the British did try to make it about slavery in a cup in New York and Virginia. And certainly, there was a concern about slave insurrections and other things taking place. So if you want to use that very loose and flimsy argument, you could do it just like you could do it for the war itself. 1861 to 1865 is all about slavery. And, of course, the response is, well, no, 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 the Southerners actually said it in their secession declarations. They talked about slavery. They made speeches about slavery. Well, this is true, but some of the states had not listed in their declaration. And we know that many of the upper South states did not secede until after Lincoln called up troops. They didn't, they weren't doing anything. So the, the fact is, the war itself was about occupation of the South and saving the Union, as Lincoln said. That was, the war was about occupation. The war was about preserving independence or preserving the Union. That's what the war was about. We can talk about secession. We can talk about motivation for secession or not. And of course, people say, well, there's no secession, there's no war. But there didn't have to be war. Lincoln could have made a choice. James Buchanan made a choice. We didn't have war for months while James Buchanan was president. So, I mean, these are these are flimsy arguments that the war was about slavery. But see, this is it. Going back to the founding generation, if that, well, I mean, if you're gonna, you can't bash George Washington, but you can bash Robert E. Lee. Why? Because he's against the United States. The very definition of treason. He's a traitor. Sided against the U.S. But any fair-minded, objective person would say, and Europeans did quite a bit, but there's no treason there. This is an independence movement. This is something that the, that the United States stood for. Independence. We don't say Americans were committing treason in 1776. No, no. They were declaring their independence. They weren't committing treason because they were no longer members of Great Britain. They were independent. And it doesn't matter if they were recognized or not. They themselves legitimately said, we are no longer part of that empire. And the same thing the South did in 1861. So to have friends, quote unquote, conservative friends like Alan Gelzo or others, shows you how far we've come in, say, 20 years, a little over 20 years since that PBS documentary was released. 30 years. It's tragic. 
And so we have a piece on Monday about Walter Walker Percy, excuse me, Walker Percy, and his admiration for Robert E. Lee. And the thing about Walker Percy, he was a liberal, very liberal. I mean, here's a man that, of his time in particular, of course, he probably wouldn't consider a liberal today. He would be, uh, you know, he, he wasn't woke enough, right? But here's a man who, of course, was an ardent opponent of segregation, ardent opponent of segregation, uh, supported federal programs like Head Start and the Great Society. This is a man that was for his time, very left. And yet, he really admired Robert E. Lee. Why? Because he thought Lee embodied the best of the South. You could be a Southern leftist, and you could still admire Robert E. Lee, because he embodied the best of the South. Same thing Booker T. Washington said about Confederate monuments. We need monuments up to the best men of the South. And so to honor these men through monuments, the best men of the South, is something that would remind Americans, not just Southerners, but Americans. Because let me tell you something. People come to the South and they want to see Confederate history because it's different. It's, it's a major tourist attraction. We're tearing all that down and removing anything that made the South unique. Nobody goes to the North and says, you know, I want to tour some northern War monuments today. I mean, unless you're a unless you're a quote unquote Civil War buff, you're not. That's not. So, but people will come to the South and they want to look at these Confederate monuments. They want to see it. Uh, I've I've already relayed the story about uh, when a reader emailed me about China, and back in the '80s there was an exchange, and I'll I'll tell it again. There was an exchange in Houston, and these Chinese. Businessmen came over to the United States, and they didn't know where Houston was. But you know what else? But you know what they did know? They knew Robert E. Lee, and all they wanted to see was the statue of Robert E. Lee. I think I'm sorry. This is in Dallas. In Dallas, all they wanted to see was Robert E. Lee in Dallas. They didn't know where Dallas was, but they wanted to see Robert E. Lee. Chinese in the '80s wanted to see Robert E. Lee because Robert E. Lee to them was the guy that thumbed his nose at the Yankee Empire. He was the embodiment of independence. And that's around the world what people think about Lee and the South. It's why the Confederate flag was flown in East Germany when the, when the Berlin Wall was coming down. There were reports that the Confederate flag was being flown in China in 1989 at the Tiananmen Square demonstration because it embodied the spirit of rebellion and independence. Thumbing your nose at the central authority at the empire. Now, and we've, we've had story after story, uh, one from Japan a few weeks back, how uh, there was a lady there, a Japanese lady visited Stone Mountain and said, my gosh, this is amazing. We need to do this in Japan to our great soldiers who we have to ridicule and ignore. And of course, oh, no, no, you can't do that because the woke denizens in Japan have decided that you can't admire the South. And this is... We're getting so far into, you know, crazy town, into this alternate reality. I mean, it's, it's just amazing to me. When you had people that admired Lee for his character, you could say that, well, I mean, uh, and people used to say this, well, we're glad that Lee lost because it kept the United States together, but is there not a better man in the history of the South than Robert E. Lee? And, of course, you could say, well, people would say, well, that's because of Freeman. I mean, if it wasn't because of Freeman, people wouldn't think this. This is not true. This is what people thought at the time. This is why men openly wept, openly wept when that war was over. And when Lee went to charge the lines himself, grabbed the horse and said, you're not going. We'll go do it. At the end of the war. And why Lee was such a draw to people. Was he a saint? No. Was Lee above reproach? No. Could Lee be criticized for things? Certainly. But he's, he's a man. But the fact is, Lee, again, through his rearing, education, through his status, reminded people of George Washington and reminded people of what made America great at the founding period. And so tearing down Robert E. Lee... The main objective is to tear down anything that traditional America has to offer, and more importantly, 
the Southern tradition and the traditional South. This is why Lee is under attack. This is why the South is under attack. It represents the other in American society that the woke generation does not want people to remember. Because to them, everything that's traditional is bad, even if it's not. I mean, we're seeing this. You know, we're seeing that uh, Yale now is not going to offer art history courses anymore because they're too Western civilization. You can't do that anymore. This is the objective. We've said it on this show several times. Take down Confederate monuments. That's the low-hanging fruit. Take down the symbols. It's, it's happening. I mean, there's, there's nothing that's going to stop this stuff, particularly when you have people move into the South in large numbers from other places, and they don't like Southern history, and they don't really care about the South. They're moving in to areas, and they're voting these things out. I mean, we, we're seeing what's happening in Virginia. Monuments are going to come down, and I would not be surprised if Robert Lee is removed from the Capitol and Nat Turner is put there. I mean, this, this wouldn't shock me because people are this stupid now. We're going to replace a man that embodied what's the spirit of George Washington with a man who was a mass murderer. I mean, it's, it's a, a homicidal maniac. That's what we're going to do. But this is where people are in 2020, 30 years after Shelby Foote awed audiences across the United States with his refined Southern character in defense of, well, the South in a way. But I mean, he wasn't completely defending the South. And in this way, when we have the piece on Wednesday by Walt Garlington, and I'm going to get into the war in a second too, but the piece by Walt Garlington, Rebuilding from the Rubble, I mean, he's he uses literature, and of course, Walker Percy, literary figure, he uses literature to show that Southerners were cognizant of this. There was this real disconnect. We Southerners understood, there's this horrible period of time, Reconstruction, and how are we going to rebuild from that? What's going to happen here? How are we going to do it? And the only thing we can do, the only thing we can hang on to, the one thing is that character of the South. Things that made the South great. Not the stuff that we can say, all right, look, fine. We got rid of these things. It's good. I mean, it's, it's wonderful that we got rid of these things in the South. That could be problematic moving forward. But um, we didn't have to destroy the South in the process. We didn't have to tear down everything about the South, right? And there were Northerners who believed this. I mean, if you look at the piece by Clyde Wilson on Thursday, Southerners is, is next installment of the Southerners movie guide, movie guide. It's a list of Northerners and Europeans who played sympathetic Southerners because for years people understood that there was something to this South thing. There was something to the South in many ways. There was something to Southerners being treated well, sympathetically, as a people, as a defeated people. We don't treat any other defeated people like we have Southerners in American history. I mean, we, we have respect for the British in the war. We have respect for the Mexican army, we have respect for uh, the Spanish, we have respect for the Germans. In many films, I mean, look, even, even the Nazis are shown more sympathetically at times than Southerners. And not, I mean, look, not often. But you'll find people that say, well, you know, I mean, I was reminded of the Band of Brothers documentary and the interviews, and they had Don uh, Shifty Powers, who of course was from West Virginia, but he's saying, you know, if that if that war hadn't come, I might have liked those Germans. I mean, they were just good Germans. You know, they were just doing their job. We were doing our job, and uh, they were just good guys. And uh, what they said, we you know, it was the SS that were the bad guys, but the average German soldier, they were okay. Where do you find this now? And you can't, these, we're talking about Americans, and these people are vilified as just being Racist hate mongers. But here we have a major documentary published by left-wingers. I mean, this is a Spielberg documentary, uh, essentially, 
Tom Hanks is involved. They're saying, that's okay to, to not hate the Germans. The Vietnamese, the Japanese, the Koreans, all these people that it's okay to say, hey, you know, these people, we, you know, we can we can admire them. We can admire these people. There, let's let's cross the chasm. Let's let's try to reconcile. But no, not the South, not even Americans in our own backyard. No, we can't do that. We can't we can't have anything to honor those people. And if you honor those people, and you say, well, you're just a bad person. It's 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 again Looney Town where we've gotten to. This is these people that are that are these social justice warriors and the social justice conservatives like Alan Gelzo. These people are in Looney Town, and they should be called out for it. You used to be able to admire Southerners. If you're a leftist, you used to think Robert E. Lee was a pretty amazing character. The embodiment of America. The spirit of independence and self-determination. These things were okay to say at one time but not any longer, not in woke 2020, and it's, it's tragic. And then you get into the uh, book review. Well, let, let me before I get to that, let me talk about the piece on Friday, which is the crisis of conservative making. And this is Paul Yarbrough, and he gets in, of course, to some things that are, that are um, you know, modern p- politics in many ways, or modern political culture. Uh, he says he's talking about this Harvard Law Review piece, which I actually talked about in one of my own podcasts last week. How the proposal is to create all these states out of DC neighborhoods so you can pack the Electoral College. And I mean, Ian Milheiser at the uh, who's now at Vox, he was Think Progress, thinks this is a great idea. The idea is to uh, wrestle control from rural America, from flyover country, and put it in the hands of elites from D.C. Like Barack Obama could be his own state. Uh, this is, he says, the crisis of conservative making. And it's because of people, he says, look, this is, just trace it back to, I mean, Eric Foner would love this idea. This is, this is centralization. The states had no sovereign rights, centralization, reconstruction, all of these things. All of this is to fix a broken democracy. And you see, what's broken to the centralists, the Lincolnians, the Lincolnian nationalists, what's broken is that we don't have enough centralization, that these states can somehow rebel or show a little resistance to the center. Um, And the conservatives, quote-unquote conservatives, who are supporting people like Eric Foner, or supporting this view of the South like Alan Gelzo as being bad, are really the Sajirondists. I mean, they are, these are people who are conspirators, and their heads will roll at some point. I mean, they're not woke enough. We've seen this every now I mean, even Stephen King, right? I mean, it's poetic justice. Stephen King comes out and says, look, I don't, I don't look at race when I'm looking at art. There should be no uh, affirmative action, essentially, in art. I mean, he's excoriated for this. Because he wasn't woke enough in that statement. Or uh, the author of Harry Potter is ripped for saying things that aren't woke enough. I mean, these are people on the left. These are the these are the cons- these are people who are not leftist enough. And they will be done away with too. You see, this is a dangerous game we're playing here. The people that are advocating these very stupid positions, these loony t- loony town positions, should be called out for being loons. And ostracized from polite society. You are a loony. Go away. I mean, this is interesting when you do watch the political theater and you see someone like Hillary Clinton saying, oh, Bernie, Bernie Sanders is a loon. The, the mainstream left, the establishment left, just like the establishment right, is trying to say that uh, the people there are 
loony because that doesn't give someone like Hillary Clinton. Now, Hillary Clinton would certainly, as President Clinton, would certainly probably you know, go along with some of these ideas. But she has to distance herself from that to try to get the average American, which she realizes doesn't really believe in these things, to vote for her. But she will govern a different way. I mean, this is generally how it works. But conservatives, conservatives, those who are supposed to be individuals who support pushing back against woke culture tend to support it. Social justice conservatives do, people like Alan Gelso. Why? Why do they do this? Because they think that the war is all about slavery, that the South should be punished, and the South is the, is the horrible other in American society. And so we have this new book by Samuel Mitchum, who writes for the Institute, just came out. It wasn't about slavery. Exposing the Great Lie of the Civil War, published by Regnery History. Um, and this is, a, this is a bold move. When you come out with a book that says it wasn't about slavery, it's a bold move. Uh, the, the review we had was by uh, Donnie Kennedy, and he points out, look, he, he shows that there's, we don't have a dichotomy in this war. It's not just the righteous North against, against the evil South. If we're going to use the righteousness to say that uh, it was anti-racist, anti-slavery, the North didn't fit that bill. He says, for example, in 1864, Republicans unanimously joined Democrats in New Jersey and passed an anti-miscegenation law outlawing marriage between white and black people. Kennedy says, regardless of such examples of northern slaveholding and northern racism, fake history teaches Americans that it is the South that must carry the burden of slavery and racism. Mitchum exposes this myth. Now, again, one thing I'll say that's really gotten people uncomfortable about the 1619 Project is that there should, <laughs> they do point out that the North at times is complicit in all this. That makes Northerners uncomfortable because they have to be the righteous good guys, right? So... And that way, I applaud the, the project for making people uncomfortable in the North. Um, so, as, as Kennedy says, Mitchum covers a variety of subjects like the constitutional right of secession, North and South cultural differences, John Brown, the terrorists, and most importantly, the costs and results of the war. He says, Mitchum concludes his book by firmly pointing out that any open-minded reader should understand that the war was not just about slavery and certainly not primarily about slavery. Mitchum explains that it was the control of a powerful, centralized, and unquestionable supreme federal government that was the primary reason for the conquest of the South. It's always about power. I mean, I, I've said this before, you know, why slavery, and I've mentioned it on this particular podcast, why was slavery important? It was an important issue. I mean, you can't get around that. Slavery was an important issue. But why was it an important issue in antebellum America? Was it because you had these virtuous Northerners who just felt bad about slaves and wanted to end the institution? No. It's because they figured out after the uh, Federalist Party fell apart following the War of 1812. I mean, look, you have to go back to that point. We have the Federalist Party... We have the War of 1812. New England doesn't really care for the war. It's hurting, it's hurting New England. And so people like Daniel Webster, who were at this time not necessarily interested in tariffs, they were interested in free trade. They thought the embargo of Jefferson and then the blockade of New England by the, by the British was killing them. And so they start trading with the British clandestinely. I mean, they're, they're actually almost, I mean, you could say they were committing treason at times. Uh, and Daniel Webster says, look, we need to secede now. And so we have nullification is a good idea. So we have the Hartford Convention. It falls apart in 18... Well, it, it works, but then the war is over in 1815. So all these Federalists who oppose the war are discredited. The Federalist Party falls apart. All their... I mean, their, their designs on power, which for years... You had the Essex Junto. They wanted to secede when Jefferson became president. Uh, they talked about secession openly. They talked about secession after the Louisiana Purchase. You had Northerners talking about secession in the 1790s. This was what Northerners wanted to do. So they're, they're now saying, you know, we need to be out after the War of 1815. Well, the war goes well for the United States at the end. The war's over. 
And now these people have egg on their face. So no one wants to call themselves a Federalist anymore. Now, you do have the Republicans, the Jeffersonians, and many of these Federalists would become Republicans, but they would be a particular type of Republicans. Now, this is not to say that all of these Republicans weren't Republicans. First, you look at Henry Clay, and I think Michael Holt has done a great job in that 18 million page book on the Whigs. But um, he shows that the Whigs weren't necessarily always the Federalists. They weren't the Federalists. I mean, a lot of them were Republicans, but they were national Republicans. Essentially, what happens is these Federalists begin to influence many Republicans who believed in Hamiltonian economics, but yet they weren't in line with the Federalists. They, they didn't like some of the political ideas of the Federalists. But still, the Federalists figure out, these old Federalists, you know how we start wedging, putting a wedge between the West and the South? You use the issue of slavery. Use the issue of slavery because if the West continues to align with the South, guess what we're never going to have? We're never going to have our political economy make it in the halls of Congress. We're never going to have the North win. We're never going to have New England become ascendant. So you use the issue of slavery, which Westerners didn't like slavery. They didn't like even blacks being in the West. I mean, Western states, Lincoln's own Illinois, had laws against blacks living there. So that's how you do it. You use the slavery issue to gain power. It's all about power. And Southerners, of course, cognizant of their political economy, their society, would defend it. Again, because they understood what was happening here. Even John C. Calhoun at one point said, hey, you know what? Maybe we need to start supporting things like canals or internal improvements for the West. Because if we can't get those people on our side, we're done. Our, our political economy is done. The agrarian political economy that we all support is done. So in that way, I mean, this is important stuff to understand how important power was in the issue of slavery and why, I mean, this, so why it wasn't about slavery is a great addition to this and why you should read it. Because again, people used to be able to see clearly through these things. Uh, it used to be okay to admire Southerners. It used to be okay to at least admire Robert E. Lee, I mean, or Stonewall Jackson. Not anymore. But this is why the Abbeville Institute, Institute exists, to ensure that this side of the story is told. And so if you're listening to this podcast, you read our material, do those things. Uh, this is why we need your support, why I said this is a collaborative effort. It's not just me. It's not just the Institute and all the scholars that right for the Institute, or Don Livingston, the president of the Institute. It's not just us, Clyde Wilson, and it can't be. It has to be about you and talking about, you know, what is it about these men, these Southern men, that was great? Their character, their devotion, their, their Christian gentlemanly demeanor. This is what made these men great. And what we still need in America, it's sorely lacking in America today. So... Hope you enjoyed this uh, episode. Until next time, good day.